Welcome back to 2 Peter. Uh, we're learning about what Peter is talking about in his letter to scattered believers in the first century there. And his letter is uh, never stop growing. Never stop growing. And um, that's the theme of this letter. And for all believers, it's important that we have that mindset, that we understand that um, when we got saved, Jesus was master. And for all eternity, Jesus will be master. And there's always room for growth uh, for those who are followers of His. And so, uh, never stop growing. And we've come to an interesting portion of the letter. It's the middle chapter um, of 2 Peter. And he is here uh, talking about false teachers and that Christians are going to encounter false teachers. Uh, last session, we talked about um, you know, being, being watching for wolves, watching out for wolves among you. That's a term that Jesus and Paul both gave false teachers. Because if you consider the church family a flock of sheep, as they're called often, um, wolves come in and they and they pick off sheep one at a time and destroy them. And so, you've got to watch out for those, especially as a shepherd, you have to be watching for those. And so, Peter is warning believers. There are wolves out there. There are false teachers who are going to infiltrate your churches and teach lies and heresies and things that are harmful and contrary uh, to what God has said. So there's a warning here, and he continues. And, and we're in the middle of chapter 2, and uh, we, we broke it up because the first part is more about the fact that there are false teachers and kind of what they might look like. Now, this portion of, of 2 Peter, it's chapter 2, verses 12 through 22. Uh, we're going to learn this, and this is the title for today's study. The substance of a false teacher. The substance of a false teacher. So 2 Peter 12 uh, through 22, uh, chapter 2, verses 12 through 22. He's going to tell us what a false teacher looks like um, and why they do what they do. What would motivate a person to deliberately take the truth of God and twist it, change it, do away with it, add to it, subtract from it. What would, what would cause a person, what would motivate someone to do that? What's the benefit in taking the truth of God and teaching something different? And that's what we're going to see here. We're going to get a sneak peek into the motives and the ultimate payment of a false teacher. So let's read together uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 12. But these false teachers, as natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness, as they, commit, uh, as they count it pleasure to riot in the daytime. Spots they are, and blemishes, sporting themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin beguiling unstable souls, and heart they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, which have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bosor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness, but was rebuked for his iniquity. The dumb ass speaking with a man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with tempest, to whom the midst of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption." For of whom a man is overcome, of the same as he brought in bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. 
For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them, according to the true proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed in her wallowing in the mire. So he's got some pretty strong words, especially at the end there. He gives a pretty graphic description of what a false teacher truly is and uh, what they're what they're really doing. But it's important for us to know what motivates them. Um, it's important for us to know this because what motivates a true shepherd, a true Bible teacher, a pastor, is um, the call of God on their life, is the care of uh, other believers and their in their congregation. Um, it is the um, desire for, for other Christians to grow in their relationship with Jesus, um, for us as a community to be accountable to one another, to encourage, to even sometimes you know, give um, a little bit of correction when necessary. A, 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 sh- a true shepherd's motive is to just follow the Lord and, and manage or steward His resources and to help His people. Um, but a false teacher has no such motives. In fact, it's not even in the view of a false teacher. There's no compassion. There's no concern for anyone other than themselves. And that's what Peter is unveiling to us so that we don't get caught up in this idea that false teachers actually care about the truth or care about God's people. Uh, Peter wants us to know this is what they're really all about. So we begin in verse 12 um, today, and it says... These false teachers, um, they are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. They speak evil of the things that they do not understand and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. He says false teachers are like crazed animals. You've probably either seen in person or on a video what a crazed animal, an animal that is just snapped and is is ferocious, and uh, it doesn't matter the size. When an animal gets mad and snapped, it just goes crazy, and it, it it's going to fulfill whatever it's desiring in that moment. And he says, false teachers are like this. They are out-of-control animals that set themselves up for capture and destruction. He says, they are, <laughs> they are out of control. What do you do with an out-of-control animal? You call animal control. And they come and they they sedate the thing and take it away. And um, many times, if you've heard of like a bear attack or something like that in a national park or uh, anything like that, you find out that they have to euthanize the animal because once it's got that kind of taste for human blood, it's it's not going to stop. So they have to take to take care of it and destroy it. Um, and he says, this is what a false teacher is like. Once they snap and, and, and they get they sink their teeth into the, um, the gifts, the rewards of deceit, of greed, of fame, of honor, once they taste that, they'll do anything to keep getting it. And he calls them just crazed animals. He says they scoff at things. They, they make light of things. They... Um, speak evil of things that they don't even understand. Now, that, that's what we call foolishness. Laughing at something that you don't understand. It's foolishness. Anybody with a, with a mind and, and any, any ounce of wisdom knows that when you make light of something that you don't completely understand, you're setting yourself up for a lot of embarrassment. And he says, these guys are foolish. They, um, they're, utter, they're going to be utterly destroyed. And he, he makes a... a Firm statement here that false teachers will not will not receive a reward of righteousness. In fact, he goes on to say, verse uh, in verse thirteen, and shall receive the reward of unrighteousness. Um, he says these these folks are going to get a reward. Um, besides the fact that they get they fill up their greed here on earth and and they receive all kinds of fame and honor and they get a following and. That, that's beside the point. He says their ultimate reward is a reward of unrighteousness. And you can imagine that's not something that you would want. 
Um, he says, because look what they've done in verse 13, they riot in the daytime. Rioting in the daytime. They, they involve themselves in wild, outrageous, drunken, immoral parties. Even in the daytime. There's no shame in their game, as we may say. They, they don't, they're not trying to even pretend that they care about the things of God. They're going to say what they want to say. Whatever will make them money, whatever will get them fame, they're going to just say it. And they're going to they're gonna live how they please. And, and because of this behavior and because of what they say, the Bible says, they will receive a reward and it'll be a reward of unrighteousness. And notice he says in verse 13, spots they are and blemishes. They are a disgrace and a stain on your system of faith. The fact that you have given them audience and that you have allowed them to come into your presence and speak such things, they are a stain on what you have going on. They, they are, have uh, begun to ruin what, what you're doing there for the Lord by allowing them to have influence. It says they bask, uh, they sport themselves with their own deceivings while they feast with you. So get this, these people are so wicked that they fellowship with you, they feast with you, and while they're eating with you and laughing and celebrating and patting your children on the head and complimenting this and that, in the back of their mind, they know they've pulled a fast one on you. They're just laughing with you and at you. They know they've got you. This is the kind of people Peter says you are dealing with. You're not dealing with people who care about you. These are wicked people that all they care about is what they can gain from you. They are bold and arrogant deceivers, false teachers. They're not cute. I don't care how smart they are. I don't care how much they they, they say they know. I don't care how many degrees that they have. It doesn't matter what kind of a home they live in. It doesn't matter who follows them. If they're not teaching the truth of the Word of God, they have one motive, according to Peter. Verse 14 continues. What else about them? Well, they have eyes full of adultery, and that cannot cease from sin. They, their eyes are filled with lustful things. They, um, they take in their eyes, and, 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 and it's implied in their ears. They take in things that fulfill their wicked desires. Notice it says they cannot cease from sin. They've gotten so deep into doing whatever makes them happy that they're controlled by their passions. They can't stop. They have been taken over by their passions. Um, that's pretty deep. They have, they have immersed themselves into so much sin that they cannot stop. They're on this roller coaster with no end. Once they've picked up momentum, they're going and there's no stopping them. They just keep feeding their desires. He continues by saying, beguiling unstable souls. They trick unstable souls. What does this tell us? A discerning person won't buy into what they have to say. People with discernment, spiritual discernment, who know what the Word of God says, immediately red flags are going to start going up in their minds. Alarms are going to start going off when false teachers start to speak. Unstable souls, those who aren't quite sure where they stand, can be deceived by these folks. Um, they are going to pick off people who love a good story, who love a little flash, who love charm, who love a new teaching. They're going to pick people off. Like, But discerning people won't be easily fooled by false teachers. Um, he says here that they have a heart they have exercised with covetous practices. They are experts in greed. They have figured out professionally how to strip people of their money and of their um, attention. They know, they, they are professionals 
at getting you to give them what they want. They work hard at obtaining more and more material possessions and fame. And then he finishes this statement with two strong words. He calls them cursed children. That's a bold ouch, right? Cursed children. They are cursed children. And uh, nothing more needs to be said about that. Verse 15. What else about them? You notice there's not been a period yet in this passage. These false teachers, it says, they have forsaken the right way. They are gone astray following the way of Balaam. They've walked away from the right path. They've gone out of the proper way. They've followed the pattern of Balaam. Do you remember Balaam from the book of Numbers? If you have your Bible there, you can turn back to Numbers 22. And there's a couple of verses we're going to read about this prophet Balaam. So Balaam was a prophet um, who was a prophet of God who was contracted by one of Israel's enemies to prophesy evil on Israel. So basically, the king of Moab says, all right, look, we will pay you handsomely and we will give you all kinds of honor and prestige if you will prophesy evil, bad things about Israel. And so Balaam would go and he would go to the Lord and say, okay, what do you want me to say to Israel? And God would only give him blessings on Israel. And Balaam would go back to the king and say, hey, look, uh, I tried, but God says, uh, here's what God says. And then he would tell him those blessings. And the guy, the king of Moab would get frustrated. He'd say, no, 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 no. Look, I'm telling you, we are going to, in fact, we're going to double it. And he, he promised to pay him more and more and give him more and more honor if he would just curse Israel. So Balaam went back to God and God would give him more blessings about Israel. And Balaam would come back to the king and say, look, man, I tried, but God's not letting me curse them. So instead of prophesying evil on Israel, Balaam thought that the wages and the honor was a pretty cool thing. So he couldn't prophesy evil against Israel. So what he did was he told the king of Moab how to infiltrate Israel and defeat them from the inside. He told them, here's what you can do. Get their sons to marry your daughters. And then once you have those relationships built, then you infiltrate them with your way of living and your religion and your culture, and they'll crumble from the inside out. So Balaam was, uh, had a really bad errand here that he was going on to give uh, bad information, destructive information to the king of Moab. Um, he would rather have a good payday and receive honor than to tell the truth. But look at Numbers 22. Here's a couple things that the king of Moab says to Balaam that I find interesting. Numbers 22, 17 is the first verse I want you to look at with me. It says, So the king of Moab says to Balaam, For I will promote thee unto very great honor, and I will do whatever thou sayest unto me. Come therefore, I pray thee, curse me this people. He says, man, I'm going to promote you to a very great honor. I'll give you whatever you want. You just curse these people. So then look at verse 37 of the same chapter. And Balak said unto Balaam, Did I not earnestly send unto thee to call thee? Wherefore camest thou not unto me? And I am, am I not able indeed to promote thee to honor? He says, man, didn't I ask you to come and curse these people? Now... I'm not able to promote you to great honor. Because you haven't done what I said, I can't give you honor. And then uh, go over to chapter 24 and look at verse 11. This is amazing. So the king of Moab, Balak, says, 24, 11, Therefore now flee thou to thy place. I thought to promote thee unto great honor, but lo, watch this, the Lord hath kept thee back from honor. So the king of Moab says, Balaam, man, I tried. I was going to give you great honor. I was going to have you on TV 24-7. I was going to have you living in the best house with the biggest congregation and the nicest things. And, 
everyone was going to come to hear your words. I was going to make you the prophet of prophets, but guess what? Your God kept you from all this honor. Wow. Wow. Can you imagine thinking that way? God is going to keep you from honor. I was going to give you honor, but God kept you from it. How awful is this? This is the kind of false teacher Peter says we're dealing with. The honor that they could receive from God, they're not interested in. Where do they want honor from? People in front of them. They want the applause. They want the cheering. They want the notoriety. They want the fame. They want everyone to know them when they walk in a room. They want influence over everyone. They want money. They want what they want when they want more than the honor from the Lord. This is the kind of people they are. Peter says these modern day false teachers are just like Balaam, more concerned about money and fame and honor than just telling the truth. Now, if you go back to 2 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse 16, he says about Balaam, but was rebuked for his iniquity, the dumb ass speaking with man's voice forbade the madness of the prophet. So what is this talking about? Now, if you don't know the story, that sounds pretty crude. But what's going on is Balaam was literally riding a donkey. And he was heading to, toward these errands of, of ruining Israel. And the angel of the Lord stood in the path of the donkey. And the donkey saw the angel of the Lord, but guess what? Balaam didn't. Balaam was so blinded at this point by what he could receive that he didn't see God standing in his way, the angel of the Lord standing in his way. He was just humming along to go do his thing. And the donkey sees it, and the donkey stops. And even at one point, the, the passage was so narrow, and on one side there was a, a wall of, of a cliff, basically. And the donkey just takes and smashes Balaam against the wall like, I'm not going anywhere. And Balaam hits the donkey and starts cursing the donkey, and the donkey speaks to Balaam. God caused a donkey to talk. Do you get this? This is how far gone greed and fame was drawing a prophet. That a, God had to cause a donkey to speak to get his attention. And the funny thing is, if you read the passage, Balaam talks back to the donkey like it's a human being. Like, how messed up is this guy at this point that he just responds to this? He didn't say like, Wait a minute, a donkey's talking? No, he just responds to him. It's hilarious. It's sad, but it's funny. But, but Peter says, these false, these false teachers in, in today's age, that's what they're like. They're, they've lost it. They're so blinded by what they're going to get on this earth in the here and now that they, they don't even see what God's trying to do. They don't see that God is, is putting on the brakes. He was rebuked for his iniquity. Look at the lengths God went to to stop this guy from collaborating with the enemy. That's how out of touch false teachers are. They're blinded by their greed and their pride. So he continues in verse 17, speaking of false teachers. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. He says the false teachers are wells without water. So a well uh, is, a, is a wonderful thing because it has water in it. But if you get to a well and you are thirsty and you lower the bucket, you lower the pail, or you uh, take the handle and you pump that handle and nothing comes out or you pull that bucket up and it's just sand, that's a disappointment. When you were, it was advertised that you were going to get water, but you got nothing. Just like a cloud that's driven by the wind and, and you say, oh, it's a drought and here comes a rain cloud. Wonderful, we're gonna get rain. And then that cloud just passes right over because it's, it's a windstorm, not a rainstorm. And it promised rain, but it left nothing. What does he say? False teachers, they promise a lot. They look like they're gonna provide, but they're empty. Their messages may sound, they say a lot, they communicate a lot without really saying anything, right? They use a lot of words and they don't tell the truth. Yeah, that's what a false, false prophet or a false teacher does. 
He says they're reserved for utter darkness. Now, think about, remind yourself of what Peter said earlier about the true prophets. They were a light. True prophets were a light. They, they brought the truth. False prophets are reserved for utter darkness. So you can see the contrast that he's making there. Verse 18, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lusts of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who lived in error. So what do they do? Well, he says, first of all, they brag on themselves with empty boasting. They use ungodly desires to lure those who may have gotten away from such things. In other words, they uh, maybe they've found some people who have trusted Christ and they, they you know their life has changed from what they used to be. They used to live in sin and, and enjoy sin and just give in to their desires, and Jesus saved them, and now they're living for the Lord, and they've left that life behind. He says what false teachers do is they lure them back with the same things that caught them in the first place. These false teachers are just really bad people. They take people who Christ has made better by His presence and by His new life, and they drag them back to their sinful old lives. They are just horrible people. They couldn't care less about the people that they influence. The only thing that they care about is getting their appetites filled. That summarizes verse 18. This is the kind of people you're dealing with. And we have to be aware because it's not always um, money that a false teacher desires. Sometimes it's a following. Just having people that they can kind of manipulate and wow and woo and, and have these learners, these followers say, wow. Have you heard what they said? Wow, they're so smart. Oh my goodness. They're teaching me things I've never heard before. Be careful. Be careful. We're seeing their true motives. We're seeing their true hearts. Verse 19. While they promise them liberty, while false teachers promise their hearers liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome... Of the same is he brought in bondage. So they promise their hearers this freedom. If you just do what we say, you'll really be free. You'll really have liberty if you'll just do what we say. But it, it says, but in fact, they themselves are slaves to sinfulness. We know the Bible says that if, if anyone has the Son, they are free indeed. The Son being Jesus Christ. All the freedom and liberty we will ever need or really could want is found in Jesus. But these false teachers come along and say, no, no, I got something better than that even. I got something that will really free you up. And they themselves are slaves to sin. And he finishes that verse with a phrase that might make you remember something that Paul said in Romans. He, he talks about how we're controlled with, controlled by, uh, whatever or whoever you've given yourself over to. So we're going to go to Romans 6.16 and see how Paul said it. He said, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants, servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. He says, Whoever you yield yourself to, that's your master. So Paul and Peter are both saying the same thing here. Don't give yourselves over to these people. Don't allow their influence in your life. Shut them out. Maybe you need to delete their podcast from your phone or your computer. Stop watching their station. When they come on the radio, turn it off. If there is a false teacher that has influence over you, do not... Any longer give them influence in your life. Remove them. Verse 20. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord, Je of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them 
in the beginning. That's interesting there. He says, so at, for af, if after being saved, you escape the pollutions of the world, and then you go back into those sinful ways, it's worse than before you knew Christ. Now that, that almost seems like, no, wait a minute, isn't it better to know Christ? than Because you can't lose your salvation. So what does he mean by this? Well, let's, let's keep reading on verse 21 and see what he says. For it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. He says, it would be better not to know the truth than to know the truth and turn from it. You know why? Because we will be held accountable for what we know. We will be held accountable for what we know. And if we know the truth and we know the Word of God and, and we choose to turn our backs on the Word of God to something else, these false teachers, he says that's worse than not even knowing the truth in the beginning because you are going to stand before God and be held accountable for what you know. And it's better for someone who doesn't know anything, right? For someone who doesn't know anything at all to hear a false teacher and then maybe be redeemed than it is for someone who knows the truth and then turn their back on it and go after the false teaching. We're going to be held accountable for the things that we know. And so he finishes, he concludes this chapter in verse 22 and his words about false teachers with this. But it is happened unto them according to the true proverb. He says, you know, really their lives, a false teacher's life, can be summed up uh, with this proverb. The dog is turned to his own vomit again, and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Proverbs 26.11 is what Peter is quoting from there. And that proverb is this, As a dog returneth to his vomit, so a fool returneth to his folly. Like I said, it's a very graphic picture. Not pleasant at all. Kind of just makes you go, ooh, and you want to get that image out of your mind. But the reason it's said is because as graphic as it is, it's easy to understand. You can kind of get the picture. <laughs> When a dog regurgitates, this is awful, isn't it? <laughs> when a dog regurgitates what it is eaten and then comes back and begins to take that in again, that is one of the most disgusting things we can view. And it is a picture, uh, Peter says, of what's happening here. It is a, it is a fool who gets rid of the sin in their life and then just goes right back into it after being cleaned out from it. This is the picture of what that looks like. And so the idea here is don't do that. If Jesus Christ has saved you and he has made you free and you are free indeed in Christ, then why in the world would you chase anyone or anything else? There is nothing, hear this, Peter says, there is nothing that can make you freer than Jesus. There is nothing that can satisfy you more than a life lived walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. So if someone comes along with a new thought, a new teaching that you've never heard before from the Bible, and uh, they're going to start giving you new thoughts and additional ideas, and, and they're gonna, they have these flashy things, uh, sayings, go with the truth. Stay with the truth. And it's important for us, friends, to know what the Bible says. That's why we believe in everyone having their own Bible, everyone studying their own Bible, everyone learning uh, with the leading of the Holy Spirit of God, teaching us what the Bible says, and truly knowing what God is saying to you that way, if and when a false teacher comes into your life, you'll be able to spot them for what they are, reject their teaching, and not give them any more influence. And so always, always, always take what you hear about the Bible and about God and compare it with the Word of God. Because God's 
teachings will never contradict what He's already revealed in His written Word. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank You for this warning. And Lord, as unpleasant as it is to consider that there are people who would try to lead others astray, it is a fact. It's a fact of this world. Evil exists. Uh, Satan wants to do everything he can to undermine what you are doing, to change your truth, even if it's just a little bit like he did in the garden. Lord, he's still doing it today, and sadly, he's using false teachers to do it. Lord, I pray that you would equip your people. Give us discernment. Help us to know your word. Help us to recognize uh, when your spirit is speaking. And Lord, that we will follow what you are saying and reject what you are not saying. And Lord, I ask that you would give us wisdom in this area. And Lord, I pray that we would fall in love uh, with your word and not just know it, but live by it. Not just know what you have said, but also know your heart, Lord. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.